The logic of what came to be called the all big gun ship was it was driven by a revolutionary new engine, the turbine, but also the firepower of the ship was based upon the largest gun possible, but only that gun. Although many people contributed to it, it was Jackie Fisher who was the presiding genius and who said, don't argue, I don't want to hear about the difficulties. This is the ship of the future and we are going to build it. Built in just a year and a day, this was a ship so definitive her name would be given to the entire class of battleships that would follow her. She was the HMS Dreadnought. One of the most remarkable features of the early years of the 20th century is how a whole and highly expensive generation of reciprocating engined mixed armament ships suddenly became totally obsolete and were replaced by the new ships of the Dreadnought era. It happened in a few years and it must have driven treasuries out of their mind. The age of uncertainty was over. Here was the age of absolute certainty. America, Germany, France, Italy, Japan, throughout a world hovering on the brink of war, the keels were laid for the new generation of warships. The British simply pursued it with greater speed and efficiency than any of its competitors did, particularly Germany. So that in 1914, Britain did have more treadnoughts than Germany had. Not many more, but just enough. And with sickening inevitability, it happened. 1914 saw all of Europe mobilized for war. The battle lines were drawn. At sea, the British Navy stood alone between the Germans and the Atlantic. Britain had the most powerful fleet on Earth, but it was untested in war. If the Germans were to break the blockade, they would need to draw the British ships out into open water and force them to engage. It was a game of cat and mouse. The British would have liked a fleet action. Their only hope was that the Germans would, of their own accord, mount a fleet, a fleet sortie. Uh, where the Royal Navy, the Grand Fleet, would take them at a disadvantage, which is exactly what happened at, at, at Jutland, uh, but not quite in the way the British expected. The Battle of Jutland would be the showdown both sides sought, but in a way neither side had planned. May 31st, 1916 found the Germans steaming northwards off the coast of Denmark when they encountered a fleet of British battlecruisers. A vicious battle ensued and the British took severe punishment. But their commander, Admiral David Beatty, suddenly realizing that he had the entire German fleet at sea, turned to draw them onto the guns of the approaching British dreadnoughts. The German high seas fleet sailed towards a horizon that was bristling with guns. Before 6.30, the British opened fire. And at a range of almost seven miles, the first the Germans saw of the enemy was the muzzle flashes illuminating the skyline. The Germans have only one choice in this contingency, run away, although it was technically called Gefechtskertwendung, battle turn away. And they do turn away, and they disappear off into the mist. It's understandable that the Germans as the weaker fleet should have a special technique for turning away. We don't need it because we will always be going towards the enemy. Jellicoe proceeded to sail his dreadnoughts across the German line, hailing fire on them until Scheer's nerve cracked. Within minutes, he was forced to execute a defensive maneuver. 
Jellico set off in pursuit, but to his amazement, the Germans turned yet again onto the British guns. At 10 minutes past seven, with the setting sun behind them, the Germans were sitting ducks. Badly mauled, Scheer ordered a second turnaway while committing the German battle cruisers to a death ride, ordering them to charge the enemy and unleash waves of torpedoes. This time, Jellico was forced to retreat. Under cover of darkness, Scheer broke free of the Grand Fleet. While Jellico, fearing another torpedo attack, held off the chase until morning and lost his only chance to remove the German threat. So the British have not succeeded in their objective of sinking the German high sea fleet. On the other hand, the Germans have succeeded in inflicting disproportionate attrition on the British fleet. And it's for that reason that some people say, perhaps on points, the Germans won. Now, in no sense did the Germans win in gaining any kind of command of the sea. The British were just as much in command of the seas outside the North Sea at the end of the battle as they had been at the start of the battle. Nightfall not only robbed Jellicoe of his victory, it stole from the big gun battleships their one opportunity to prove their worth. One can only wonder what a few more hours would have made of Jutland. But the first great clash of the dreadnoughts was also to be the last. The Germans, relieved to have escaped annihilation, switched their strategy to U-boat attacks on commercial ships in the Atlantic. It was to prove a costly mistake. No longer were the Americans on the sidelines. Within a year, they were in the war. And with them came the new breed. USS Texas, launched in 1914, was the new generation of Dreadnought. The most powerful warship afloat, with 10 14-inch guns mounted in five twin turrets, and a second battery of 18 5-inch guns for use against destroyer attack. Added to this were four torpedo tubes below the waterline. And in 1916, Texas was the first to acknowledge the emerging threat from the air, adding anti-aircraft guns and armor. As flagship of the fleet, her command and control center was heavily protected. Operations remained possible even under the most severe bombardment. What we're in now is the armored conning tower. It's essentially a, a duplicate uh, equipment-wise of what you would find on the main bridge where they would navigate the ship from. The development of the armored conning tower as you're seeing it is really comes about in the area of, of the dreadnought, second generation dreadnought like the USS Texas. There's 12 inches of armor on top and on the sides. Uh, it's face-hardened, uh, carburized armor. It take about six months to make each plate of this armor. And in this compartment here, you had main battery fire control. And as you see in here, the range and deflection indicators for the main batteries. You, here you can see the attitude of the ship. And here, you've got the indicators for all five of the 14-inch uh, turrets. And there would be an officer in here who would then uh, indicate uh, range deflection for uh, the 14-inch guns and uh, indeed would fire uh, the main battery right from here. In fact, though, captains rarely, if ever, commanded from these during battle conditions. They kind of wanted to be seen as accepting the same risk as their men. Up to Jutland and after Jutland, the prevailing belief was that 